Go on. All right, let's focus on my class, put everything else away. Thank you. Because tomorrow, um, tomorrow's the day where you ask me questions. So today is the review where I give you everything that you need to know. And I'm gonna start from the top again, um, just so we're clear and go a little bit quickly and then move on. So what I gave you yesterday for chapter seven all together was that the problem is in chapter seven, verse one. So if I were making a study guide, if I were you, I would say study guide, first Corinthians part two. And then I would just write down what is that I'm saying. And then you can go back and kind of put two and two together because you have this, you have my PowerPoint, and now you're having my, my review of this, and you should have everything that you would need in order to study. Tomorrow, I will tell you what it is that I'm taking off the test. But I'm going to go over everything, and then tomorrow I'll tell you what it is that I'm taking off the test, okay? So, um, chapter 7, verse 1 is where we find the problem. And remember, the problem is the fact that he received a letter of Paul from the Corinthians, and... They have, he's quoting them and says that um, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. So they're being told that sex is wrong, and he spends the entire chapter saying that that sex between one man and one woman in marriage is permissible. If you want to get married, um, and as a byproduct, have sex, that's okay. Um, if you're going to remain single, that means you're going to be celibate and, and abstain from sex. If you're a widow, um, you can do either or, you can get remarried, or you can, you can stay as a widow and stay single. Um, if you're betrothed, you're engaged, you can get married. And then he talks about when you should get divorced and when you should not get divorced. But all stems from the problem in 7-1. What I want you to remember is that if I were to ask you a couple things. One, does Paul say that everyone must be single? No is the answer. He says he wishes they are. That, that's a wish. That's not a command. And he goes into talking about why. I'm not going to assess you on that. I'm just going to assess you. Does Paul make the blanket statement that everyone should be single? No. Does he say that everyone should get married? No, because he himself is single. So he's not saying that. He's saying that you can do either one. Both are honoring to God. Both are um, whatever you do, whether it's being single or getting married. Um, do that and do it to the glory of God. This is going to be his ultimate message for the whole, separate, the whole second part. In, and I think that's actually in chapter 2. Whatever you do, do for the glory of God. Um, so I'm going to test you on the problem, step one, and then your understanding of the application that if you're going to get married, awesome. If you're going to stay single, awesome, but be celibate. Um, and then in chapter 8, we spend a little bit more time, and I gave you some verses. Um, and I'm going to re-go over the verses with you, because I want you to understand the context. That my statement says, do not eat food sacrificed to idols. If it causes your brother, to, your brother whose conscience is weak to stumble, so the opposite of this is true as well. That you can eat food sacrificed to idols if it does not cause your brother to stumble. So if I were to ask you, does Paul say, "Do not eat food sacrificed to idols"? That's a blanket statement that would be false because he doesn't say that you should never eat food sacrificed to, to idols. And that's where we have to read in chapter eight, at the very beginning. He says, "Now concerning food offered to idols." We know that all, all of us possess knowledge, and he talks about that, um, he goes in and talks about how, how everything is clean. Verse 5, for although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many, and he says, quote, gods and many lords, many people believe in these things. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. Um, so, no idol is real, there is no God, so eating the meat isn't actually meaning anything or doing anything, um, it's permissible. However, verse 7, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with the idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. Um, food will not com uh, commend us to God, uh, we are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. Um, Meaning that if it's going to defile your conscience, don't do it. Um, for them, it's it's a recent convert, and if that person is going to eat that meat, they're going to associate eating that meat with the worship of that pagan god. And Paul's saying it's wrong for that person to eat the meat if it's gonna in their conscience, um, more or less worship another god, right? Because you can't worship more than one god, which is why he said there's one god. But then you, as the brother or sister of Christ, if if you are with them and you eat the meat in front of them, and you cause a stumbling block to them, then you have sinned. 
So even though it's right for you to eat it, it is not right for you to eat in front of them or it's gonna cause them to sin. So now our measurement of morality has to do with how it impacts the person next to us. So this phrase of do not cause your brother to stumble is this gray area of morality. That something may be a struggle and a temptation for you that's not for me, and that's okay, but I need to make sure that, that my liberties or my, um, my, my freedom in the gray area isn't going to um, be a stumbling block for you. And then the, the big example that I always give is that if we were all 21 and we were all drinking and one of you is an alcoholic, then I probably shouldn't go to the bar with you and say, oh, don't worry, just don't drink, but I'm going to drink. Or, hey, just have, have one. You're not going to get drunk because... Every psychologist knows and says that if you are an actual alcoholic, if you're an addict to something, the only option is sobriety. If you're an addict to drugs, you have to stay away from drugs. You can't just say, oh, I'm just going to smoke one time or get high one time. No, you, it's, there's something wrong in the brain, and the brain cannot disassociate that. So it is wrong for you to take your, your recovering alcoholic friend to the bar. It's wrong because you're causing them to stumble. You're putting them in a position of sin. And I would say for you guys that if it, a lot of it may be coming into play with are you encouraging each other to honor your father and mother and their rules? That we'll always encourage each other, oh, it's just, you know, let's just stay out one hour later. They're not going to know. They're not going to catch us. Whatever it is, you guys should be encouraging each other and following their own household rules, even though it's not your household rule. Um, we know that we can apply chapter 8 to other things. It's not just about food sacrifice to idols, because Paul does that in chapter 9. We've spent a lot of time in chapter 9 last week talking about how he doesn't want to be a stumbling block for the Corinthians by taking their money. And he uses that same phrase, stumbling block. So he's taking his own scenario of idol meat, and he's applying it now to the Corinthians in chapter 9. Which lets us know that, that the principle is, is a big principle of not causing your brother or sister to stumble not just with idol meat, but even now here it's with misunderstanding the gospel of chapter 9. But we've already gone through chapter 9. Um, and then in chapter 10, he goes on to talk again. It seems to be that food sacrificed to idol, idols is, is an issue in Corinth um, because that's what Corinth is. It's a city full of different, different gods and goddesses and different forms of worship. And so he's trying to help them kind of wade this water. And, and he's being careful not to, to take the side of the legalists or the hedonists. He's giving us principles. So in chapter 10, when he says, Do not eat food sacrificed to idols. If you believe in your old pagan practices, you cannot mix the Lord's cup and the cup of the demon. Um, here it seems to be that these are the hedonists who are saying, Oh, I can be a, a Christian and I can still, I can do both. I'm just going to add Jesus to, to my group of gods. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do both that I'm going to call myself a Christian and, and this other thing. And he's drawing a line saying, no, you can't do both. So here's where you cannot eat food sacrificed to idols, is that if you are still worshiping that foreign god, no, you can't mix the two. So he is drawing a very clear line here that it's one or the other. You're either worshiping Jesus or you're worshiping a demon. You can't worship both Jesus and a demon. And again, that's, that's specific. That's, that's on the, the, the person themselves. Right? So he's not saying no one should ever eat food sacrificed to idols. He's saying these people who, who are trying to do both, that they need to stop. You, you cannot mix Jesus and other religions. Would be, be another way of saying it. Now, a specific verse um, where it says um, that statement um, is in verse 1021. So you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of the demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of the demons. Shall I provoke the Lord to jealousy? No, are stronger than he. Now I use that word jealousy because that's what, what God says in, in the Old Testament, right? That I'll have no other gods before me because I'm a jealous God. So he's saying don't, don't test that. Don't do that. Um, in 1023 to 33, there's an interesting little story. It says... Um, my thing is, do not eat food sacrifice to idols if the person who serves it believes that you agree with their worship. And here's where the verse is found. It says, and um, well, he, kind of, he starts off with, with a phrase that he said in chapter 5 in, in 10.33. It says, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Um, he had said that before, 
maybe it's actually the beginning of chapter six, but he's saying all things may be permissible or legal for me to do them, but that doesn't mean I should do them. So can you take an example, what's, up, what's something that is legal, or not legal in our culture to do, but doesn't mean as a Christian we should do it, we should ask twice? What's an example of something that we have the legal right to do, but that doesn't mean we should do it? So we just spent some time abortion. talking about it yesterday, it would be wonderful. Abortion. Abortion, right? If it's legalized, it doesn't mean that we should do it. Um, you know, pick, pick any, 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 any topic that, that God's law will always supersede the, the government's law. And so you may have... You know the and you begin marijuana. So you may have the legal right in a, in a state to, to smoke marijuana, but that doesn't mean that you should do it. Um, doesn't mean that it's beneficial or helpful for you to do it. And then he goes into in the example, and the example that he's dealing with. Um, again, he says that all food is clean; that it's all all made by made um, by God. Um, and then starting at verse 27, it says, If one of the unbelievers, so now it's your interaction with people who, who, who are not of your faith, <clears throat> invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. This, this, is a, um, this would be a, a note specifically to those who are going into missions work that um, one of the, the things that you're told when you're missionary in, in the majority of the cultures around us um, around the world is that eating food is 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 an easy way to show respect and it's also an easy way to offend someone when someone offers you food you eat all of it as a form of a thank you um, and and I tell students whenever we go on a trip you need to eat everything even if you don't like it you need to eat it because they spend time preparing it and making it for you so eat it and my grandpa um, who was a missionary in Brazil for 30 years grandpa and grandma and my mom and siblings grew up in Brazil for a different period it said that the missionary prayer is is Lord um, help me get it down and Lord help me keep it down um, meaning that, that all missionaries know that you're gonna come across weird foods and it's a sign of respect to eat the food um, and pray that you don't get sick from it um, because you end up at some point getting sick so he's saying you should go and you should eat whatever is given in front of you. That, that's a sign of respect. But then he goes into verse 20 and says, But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, and then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I do not mean your conscience, because we already know that the food is, is, is clean, but his, for why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Meaning that the reason that you're not going to eat the food is not because you have a problem with the food, but because you're giving the impression to this unbeliever that you accept their form of worship. So now this new situation is, he said before, you yourself cannot mix Jesus with other gods. Now he's saying you can't give the impression to unbelievers that you are mixing Jesus with other gods. So he's saying don't eat if the person who serves it thinks that you agree with their God or are worshiping their God. Is the line that he draws. Does that make sense? Now so if I were to give you that verse and you were to read it, I want you to be able to like, oh yeah, I know that this is a metaphor or an analogy and I can pick it apart. Or you're going to read it and be like, I have no idea what it's talking about. So if you read um, 10, 20, uh, 7, all the way to 30, and none of that makes sense to you, then you need to come and, and talk to me and hash that out so that you can, or find a way to ask me questions tomorrow where you can say, Are you, does this mean this? And then I can say yes or no. And then he ends with a little side note. This is more of a, um, a cross-cultural application in 31. So whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Um, and this is what ties it back into chapter 9 again, that his whole goal is, is to, to do whatever it takes to spread the gospel. So in your actions, you can do everything to the glory of God, but the ultimate goal is to spread the gospel. So if what you're doing is hindering the gospel, which 
eating meat with someone who actually believes it's been sacrificed to a god is, is hindering their understanding of the gospel. So a way to minister to someone, say, I'm sorry, I can't eat what you've given me because, because I can't worship your God. Because I believe in, in Jesus and the one true God. And then I think that's maybe more what he's teaching them is this is a way to evangelize them. That there's a time to eat with them and then there's a time to, to teach them and preach to them. Um, chapter 11 um, is, is confusing um, because it talks a lot about you know women uh, should cover their heads. And so we'll say, does it literally mean head covering? And there are still church traditions that, that still tell, say that, that no woman actually should need to have their head covered um, because of what Paul says. Um, and my, my biggest rebuttal to that is that when he talks to the Ephesian women, he does not tell them to cover their head. So if Paul wants all women for all time to actually cover their head, he would have given the command to both the Corinthian women and the Ephesian women. But he doesn't. He gives different commands to them. So that means there's something cultural going on. That's one of our biblical uh, ways that we interpret is that if, if Paul doesn't say the same thing to two groups, then that means that it's cultural and there's a principle to be taken out of it. Um, another big, this is kind of a, a big idea, is that whatever Jesus says and the New Testament authors repeat, those are big things. But if there's something that just the New Testament authors say that Jesus never said, then there's something cultural there that they're applying something that Jesus said. So here... Um, in, in all of it, in, in chapter 11, the first 15 verses, what he's really describing, and what scholars look at it, is, is gender roles within Corinth. That the reason he tells the women they should have long hair and cover their head um, is because they're either going to appear as the wrong gender, or they're going to appear as a temple prostitute, is, is, is part of the confusion. And sometimes the temple prostitutes would cross-dress, right? Because if temple prostitutes were, were allowed, that you can, you can sleep with either gender. Um, and that the prostitutes would, would sometimes cross dress to try and attract the whatever gender the person wanted, right? So it's the same culture there were now, but for them it was just it was it was their form of of, of worshiping, you know, to to Aphrodite. Now it's just um, it's this atheist culture. Well, there is no god that worshiping. We're just doing it. Um, so there's a lot of crossover um, between Corinth and us today. Um, but he's telling them that dress this certain way so that you're not confusing the culture and corn of who Jesus is, right? You don't want to misrepresent Jesus. So women, um, cover your head, keep your hair long, because that, that's going to uh, um, um, keep you from appearing to be something that you're not. And then he tells the men, don't, um, don't throw your hair out, keep it short, because the men that have long hair are either perceived as temple prostitutes or, or as homosexuals. Um, that they're trying, again, they're trying to, and there's a little bit of transgenderism in there, and this is that they're trying to appear as the different opposite gender to attract um, someone of that gender or of that opposite gender. And so with all this confusion, Paul is, is giving them a prescription for them. So then for us, it'd be what in our culture is giving that impression. Is there something that, that we do that is giving us the impression that we are the opposite gender that we're not naturally born with? Um, or are we, um, yeah, or, or, what's the one? I mean, I guess we're not, I mean, we're not trying to appear as prostitutes. Some people are. That's a side note. Um, but the idea of, of, of reinforced gender roles is culturally specific. What we might find here in, in Phoenix in terms of what a guy looks like and a girl looks like is, is different than what we would find in, in, in Cambodia or in a lot of Asian cultures. Um, and so it, as a, I would say as a missionary, you go in and figure out, well, what are the associated gender roles of guy and girl? And, and teach them to follow those. Don't reinforce your own cultural concepts onto them. Figure out what are their already existing cultural concepts. Does that make sense? So that's why the Corinthians, he tells them Here's your gender roles, and then for the Ephesian women, he'll tell them something different because their struggle is different. So all I'm gonna and the verses I give you in this, it'll literally say, women keep their hair long, men don't keep your hair long. And I'm gonna ask you why is that? And I want you to understand it's it's because he doesn't want them to be confused with either gender or with or with being a temple prostitute. Is kind of the other one because in the temple in the temple they were confusing genders as well. Um, the Lord's Supper is, is simply um, that they would, 
they were coming together, um, and you know, we take communion at church um, in a very different way, but for them, they would come and and they would all sit down together and literally, you know, break bread, and, and they would they would do it in a similar format. Sometimes it would be after a meal, um, sometimes it would be just to do that. But what it seemed like is that people were um, coming to whoever's house it was to take communion, and they weren't waiting for each other. Some were coming hungry because they were like, oh, there's gonna be bread there, I'll just eat all the bread. Some were drinking all the wine to get drunk, and they are just kind of using it as a time to party. And Paul's saying, you're really misunderstanding the whole point of the Lord's Supper. Um, and so he spells it out for them. Here's, here's the purpose of communion. Um, and most of our churches, if you listen, go listen this Sunday and, and go see. And I bet you, um, I just bet you that what they're reading from is 1 Corinthians chapter 11. That's the one that, that, that is used the most because it's, it's stated the most succinctly. Um, where it says, this is my body, which is for you, this remembers of me. And then we also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup, the new covenant, and my blood, do this as often as you drink it, and remember of me. Um, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That specific phrasing um, is, is, is Paul. Um, and then he goes into how you do it in an unworthy, or unworthy manner, but um, I'm just going to have time to cover that. I just want you to know that they were overindulging, they were misusing communion. So our application is, are we taking communion properly? Are we taking it with the right heart and the right attitude? Do you understand what it represents? And, and if you don't understand what it represents, you need to go and, and, and re-listen to your pastors, or go re-read the Gospels, or read chapter 11, and figure out what exactly is communion for, and then make sure you take it with the right heart and the right attitude. But it is it is one of, um, it, it is a uh, across the board practice that every church tradition has and has always had, we just do it differently. Um, and it's okay that we do it differently, but you should do it. If you don't ever take communion, I would say that you're being disobedient if you never take communion. Um, and so make sure when you do take communion, you do it with the right, with the right attitude. The way that I'm going to test you over chapters 12, 13, and 14, I think I alluded to this, is more or less, do you understand that the problem seems to be based off of his wording, that everyone is, is mis, misusing or misunderstanding um, spiritual gifts. They all are favoring some gifts above others, particularly they're favoring the supernatural gifts above the, uh, uh, the unsupernatural. You know, like having the gift of mercy um, seems to be like a personality type, uh, but like having the gift of speaking in tongues, that's something that, you know, like that clearly the Holy Spirit is enacting that. And I think Paul's actually saying, no, the gift of mercy is something from the Holy Spirit. The gift of, um, of the wisdom, knowledge, faith, um, healing, and then it goes into them, the, the, their healing, working miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, which is discernment, various kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Um, and this is in chapter 12, starting in verse... Four. It says, now there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit, there are a variety of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good, meaning it's not for you, it's for the, for everyone. And for the one given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom. That, so yeah, he, he lists all of these. And he's saying that if they're all given by the spirit, right, then one is better than the other. Because you didn't choose it, you didn't take it, the spirit gave it to you. And then he goes on and, and talks about how, how we can't all have the same gift um, because we're, he uses this analogy that, that we're all, all different parts of the body. We can't all be the ear. We can't all be the eye. We can't all be the nose because, because then we'd be an imbalance. We want to be a complete body. And so our, the church needs to consist of all spiritual gifts in order for it to be healthy and, and, to, and to function. And the reason he's saying this is because they're not doing it. They're all favoring certain, and it seems to be they're all favoring tongues. And he's saying that can't be. You can't all, all of you can't all speak in tongues um, because that would be an imbalanced body. <clears throat> and there shouldn't be divisions among, among you based on, on playing favoritism over what he's seeing in a tongue. Um, so, do you understand that the problem is that they seem to be favoring gifts, which is why he gives them this prescription of no, they're all from the Holy Spirit. 
and we're all different parts. Um, and then he goes in right in the middle of what we did um, on Monday, right, did Wednesday, was 13 was on the chapter of love. And to recall from that, he starts, if I speak in tongues of men and of angels but have not love, I'm a noisy gong. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remount but have not love, I am nothing. Those are all the gifts that he just listed. And so he's telling them that you're being selfish and what you're doing is not in love, which is why he tells them to do it in love. And then he ends with all these things are going to fade away anyway, right? And then 14, which I think is one of the, the, the hardest ones to understand because not everyone agrees on the use of speaking in tongues. Um, but he seems to be saying, again, um, which gift edifies the church the most? And his whole point is that the gift of prophecy is the one that edifies the church. And the gift of tongues is something that's between you and God. Um, and if there's someone there to interpret, then that's even better. Um, I haven't been in a, in, a, in a worship service where I've seen someone speaking in tongues and someone interpret it. Um, I know it exists and it's there, but a lot of people, um, what I find is they just are all speaking in tongues at once, which was the exact problem that the Corinthians were having, was that they were all speaking in tongues at once. And he's saying that shouldn't be, which leads us to this last part, which is order in the worship service. Um, and the couple verses I can give you, um, in 1433 it says for God is not a God of confusion but of peace and then verse 40 says that all things should be done um, de decently and in order so because there's chaos in their service and they're all speaking in tongues at the same time he tells them here's how it should be done in a proper order and there shouldn't be confusion in the worship service because God is the God of order and so it's okay that our services um, seem to be you know, we do this and this and this and this and this um, because that's how it's been done since since the writing of this letter. So there's been an order of, of the service because God is a God of order. Now, does that mean we can't change it? That, you know, if you ever had your pastor or the moment say, you know what, I was going to say this, but I feel like I need to talk about this. Anybody have your pastor ever do that? Right. So that's them with the Spirit's prompting saying, you know what, maybe I need to actually focus on this. So there still is room for the spirit to move and change, um, but to, to have worship service unplanned um, and with no structure, um, I don't think is, it, it makes it a true worship service. It makes it something else. Um, maybe it's just a get together or hang out, but it's not necessarily a worship service. Um, uh, chapter 15, um, again, I gave you that it's the, a creed um, from the beginning. And so when he goes in to talk about the that people are denying that there was that, that we have a resurrection, um, that it's because he's already stated here's who Jesus Christ is in the creed in one through eleven that he uh, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he was resurrected on the third day um, as was foretold in Scripture, and then he appeared uh, to um, to Peter and then to the disciples, and then to five hundred people and everyone else, and then he goes in to, to talk about the resurrection because that's the last piece of our Christology or, or what we need to, to, to believe about Jesus is that, that we're going to be resurrected in a physical body because Jesus was and that he's coming back is kind of his ending point in chapter 15. So, so all of 15 is, is this statement of belief about what you need to believe about Jesus. But he goes into detail because some people are saying, no, you're not going to be resurrected. You're, you're going to stay dead. Once you die, you die. Saying, no, that's wrong because Jesus was resurrected, um, and that would be a contradiction. So that's his proof. Jesus is resurrected, so we're going to be resurrected. And they're saying, okay, there may be resurrection, but it's just spiritual. You don't, your actual body isn't resurrected. That's, and that that kind of comes from some um, some some uh, Jewish um, offshoot beliefs. And he's saying, no, that's wrong because that would make Jesus a liar. That if we don't have a physical resurrection, then what was the point of Jesus' physical resurrection that we saw? Remember, he says he appeared to 500. People saw him. So if people saw a resurrected body, then we're going to have a physical resurrected body as well. And, that, and, and it's almost he's elevating this, that you have to believe this in order to call yourself Christian. If you deny one of these two, or either of these, then you're, not, you're denying what it is that Jesus taught. And if you deny what Jesus taught, then you're calling Jesus a liar, and he's not Jesus, and that and that's a huge problem. Um, so I went through a lot, and I and I went through a lot of it because I wanted me to make a video. Um, but 
Now I want to give you time to ask me questions. What's something that you need me to restate? Or these are you going to want us to know this? Or, or whatever. Yes. So chapter nine is based off of all of last week's double. So if you go into Google Classroom, I gave you my slides, and go look at those questions and see do you have answers to those in your notes. So know that chapter nine is in is in your work or in your notes from um, from last week. Chapter thirteen is Monday, and chapter fifteen was yesterday. So if you go open those slides, go make sure you have answers to those questions. And I would say go plug that in as you're making your study guide. Um, take a break from this, go to chapter nine and find those answers and then move on. And then tomorrow clarify, you're like, here's what I have from chapter nine. Is this correct? So tomorrow's the day where you're going to clarify, you know, did you get last week correct? Yes. Um, so we had so many problems, like the problems in each chapter. So I want <clears throat> whatever I put here. Um, like, is there certain verses you have to know from which one? I'm going to put the verses on the test. Oh, so um, I, I'm going to want to know your understanding of the verse okay, so based off of what was on here. Like, can you can you read, um, you know, fourteen twenty six to forty? If I were to give you a couple of verses, they why why is he saying why why? Why am I reading this? You go, oh, because there was chaos in the, in the worship service. So he's telling them to have an orderly worship service. Yeah, if you go through what I've given you and you study that as if it were a study guide, then you're going to be good. Yeah. Okay, so come tomorrow with questions. I would say spend some time tonight. Um, assembling all the information. If you have something missing from a chapter, then that's a hole that needs to be filled from chapter 7 to 15. <coughs> so you guys can chill out for the next nine.